Hi, tonight I'm going to talk about refrigeration. By a large fraction, the most common type of refrigeration technology involves phase change. Everybody knows that when you compress a gas, it becomes hot, and when you allow it to expand, it cools. However, if you can compress the gas sufficiently that it changes phase into a liquid, it releases a great deal of heat. And conversely, if you allow the liquid to evaporate and change phase back to a gas, it will absorb a lot of heat. In a typical phase change refrigerator, a compressor will compress a gas such as a fluorinated hydrocarbon like Freon and it will turn it into a liquid and produce a very hot liquid. That liquid then will transfer its heat through a heat exchanger into the atmosphere and then that relatively cooler liquid will move over to an expander where it's allowed to once again change phase back to a gas. That cold gas then travels through a secondary heat exchanger where it absorbs heat from a refrigerator or from a room, and then that relatively warmer gas will return back to the compressor to continue the cycle. Now this is a very efficient process and it's a very robust technology, but there are some modifications on that that are kind of interesting and that's what we're going to talk about. To begin with, you don't have to have phase change within a closed system. Every time you get out of the shower and the water evaporates, you're enjoying phase change refrigeration. If you've ever worked at a construction site, you're probably familiar with what's called a swamp cooler. In this kind of a device, a large low speed fan will blow air through a mist of water droplets. The water will evaporate, will drop the temperature and provide relief for the construction crew. But in the process, it adds a lot of humidity, and that can be kind of unpleasant, and that's why it's called a swamp cooler. Now, if you're in a very dry environment, that additional humidity may not be a bad thing. It may even be desirable. But if you're not, and you don't want to add additional humidity, there's another interesting take on that. If you take a material like this, which is a desiccant, it's based on a molecular sieve, and has a high absorption coefficient for water, and you heat it either electrically or with combustion or with concentrated solar, you can drive off the absorbed moisture. If you then allow the desiccant to cool back down to room temperature while in contact with a heat sink, passing air, room air, over this desiccant will allow the water in the air to be absorbed into the desiccant and even though the air temperature doesn't really change, the relative humidity drops down near zero. Consequently, you can then reintroduce humidity either through a mist or a moist surface and bring the humidity back up to where it started but the temperature has now dropped. One of the neat things about this process is obviously it doesn't involve any kind of fluorocarbons, just water and an inert desiccant. And in addition, it doesn't require very much electrical power because all you need electricity for in this case is to power the low speed fans that move the air. The, the work for the refrigeration is provided either by combustion or even concentrated solar. A sort of takeoff on that is what's called thermonic refrigeration. It actually involves the boiling off of electrons. If you've ever seen a vacuum tube, that glowing in the vacuum tube is the heating of a thermonic emission source where at a certain temperature a metal or a semiconductor will boil off its hot electrons and in the process cool. The problem with that is that it operates only at incandescent types of temperatures, but there's some research being done by incorporating semiconductors or even meta-structured, nanostructured surface features such as little pyramids or fine hairs that concentrate the electric field on the surface and enhance the thermonic emission. As a result, if you can get this down to about a tenth of an electron volt, that's about the temperature where a practical refrigeration could take advantage of that. However, that kind of technology is just beyond anything that we're going to be trying here. And so a little more approachable is a method called magnetic refrigeration. This 
is gadolidium. And gadolidium is often called a magnetocaloric material. Really what it is is a ferromagnetic material. It can be magnetized. But its Curie temperature, the temperature at which its electron spins or its magnetic alignment will break down is very close to room temperature. So what happens is when you put a material like gadolidium in a magnetic field, the electron spins in the metal will all align. As a result, the entropy, the randomness of the system, drops and it releases heat. If you then allow this material to be removed from the magnetic field, the thermonic vibrational electrons in the neighborhood will cause some of these aligned electrons to disalign. The entropy increases, just like when a liquid goes to a gas, and the material cools. Let me demonstrate how this works. What I have here is a temperature meter hooked up to a temperature probe inside of a test tube containing some chunks of gadolidium. The liquid in here is a low viscosity silicon oil and the reason for that is that in a practical refrigeration system you have to be able to transfer the cooling and the heating from the rough surface of the metal to some usable transportable uh, medium like the oil. In this case, it's going to be transmitting the heating and cooling that occurs in these crystals to the probe. Silicon oil provides protection of this material because it tends to corrode very easily in water and in oxygen. And because it has a very low specific heat, about a quarter of that of water, whatever kind of heating, heat addition or subtraction that occurs in the process produces a greater temperature differential because the absolute specific heat of this unit of the liquid and the crystals is lower so you'll get a bigger temperature differential. Now if you watch as I place this test tube into this powerful gap magnet of about 0.8 tesla the temperature here on the meter is reading about 62.56 degrees. I'm using Fahrenheit simply because it has a smaller temperature gradient or a smaller unit and you'll see a higher resolution in the temperature change. Now when I insert this in here I have to be kind of careful because this stuff is pulled down toward the magnet. 62.6 degrees. Now when this goes in you'll see very quickly that the temperature begins to rise. The process is almost instantaneous in the metal but the heating has to be transferred through the oil to the probe. Over a period of a couple minutes conduction will pull that heat out of the liquid and the crystals and they'll return back down to room temperature. At that point, I'll pull the tube out and we can see what happens to the temperature. Something to note though is obviously the temperature only went up about one degree Fahrenheit. And that's one of the difficulties of using gadolidium as a magnetic caloric material is because it has a very small temperature change. So to make a practical refrigerator using this, you either have to cascade several stages of magnetic and demagnetization or use some clever countercurrent methods where you have fluids moving in one direction and magnets moving in the other direction. There are a number of researchers working out there on this problem. We've played around with this a little bit and we've been getting some success, but we'll see where this goes. The real breakthrough with this will come with some of these new alloys that are being developed at several universities around the world that have a much larger magnetocaloric effect, a much greater temperature differential with the magnetization. And if that becomes available, widely available, it's already available, but if it becomes practically commercially available, uh, this can take off because this has an even higher efficiency than the phase change systems that are out there and it doesn't involve high pressures, which is kind of nice. While we let this go through its thing, we're going to talk about the more practical or most practical at this point alternative to the phase change refrigeration. And that involves using Peltier devices, often called thermoelectric coolers. These are pretty neat devices. They have a number of advantages. To begin with, this particular unit on eBay costs about $9 and is rated at about 175 watts, although as I'll explain later, you'll never want to use it anywhere near that rating. The units are very lightweight. This weighs about 30 grams. It is solid state, so there are no liquids to leak. There are no moving parts. As a result, there's no vibration, no noise. It is very convenient to use because of the fact that its electrical operation is just about as basic as you can get. It looks like a resistor. So you apply a voltage to it and it will self-limit its current. So you could power this with as simple a system as a battery. 
and it's bidirectional. If you allow the current to go in one direction, it will flow heat in one direction. If you reverse the polarity of the leads and flow current in the opposite direction, it will pump heat in the opposite direction. Kind of neat and kind of convenient. To explain though what's going on here, I'm gonna grab my little visual aid and I'm gonna show you basically what the process is. The effect was discovered about 250 years ago by an Italian uh, scientist and then it was rediscovered by Peltier and Seebeck uh, about 30 or 40 years later. Remember they didn't have the internet, they didn't have Google, they didn't have YouTube and so rediscovery of, uh, of inventions was much more common many many years ago. But effectively what happens is in a non-conductor the individual atoms have outer loosely bond, bound electrons but because the lattice structure means that an electron near its, its parent atom uh, has to drop and raise energy levels as it tries to move between the atoms and conduct electricity, it doesn't. In metals and semiconductors, there is a much smoother gradient of energy levels between the atoms, and so the free and most loosely bound electrons can travel through metals, not without resistance, but much more easily than in a non-conductor. When you have two different types of metal, say bismuth or tin and copper, what happens is when you produce a current and you try to drive these conductive electrons to the dissimilar metal, at the junction, one of the metals is going to have a higher lattice energy for its conductive electrons and the electron cannot get into the neighboring atom through the junction unless the vibrational thermonic electrons in this area can provide enough of a kick to get a particular conduction electron up to the level that it's able to enter the lattice of the higher electron energy metal. Once it does so, it is absorbing heat at that junction to do this, so this gets cold. As the electron travels across this higher energy level metal, it finally comes to another junction where it has a surplus of energy and will release and transfer some of that energy to the electrons near the junction and this junction will heat. Now for you monopole people and you infinite energy people, there's no way to do this without two junctions because at some point if you've got two different metals, this metal is gonna eventually have to couple back to say the copper. So you're always gonna have two junctions. And as you can see, the process is reversible. If the current flows in this direction and energy is added here, this junction cools. And when energy is dumped here, this energy heats. Interestingly enough, the process is not only reversible, but it's invertible. Because this metal has a higher energy lattice, conductive electrons tend to pour off of it and it tends to be relatively electron deficient. If you provide heat at one of its junctions, and kick some of the electrons in one of the conductors up to that higher energy level. These electrons will travel along that conductor until they fall off the other cliff, releasing some of that energy in the form of heat. So the heat applied here is spilled off here, but in the process we've created a current. So this process is often called the Seebeck effect and it's what uh, the principle behind thermonic generators. Let me demonstrate what happens here with this little meter. I've got this Peltier device hooked up to a multimeter. We're gonna hook this up and turn it to DC. Now because both surfaces of this TEC are at the same temperature, there's no voltage. But if I warm the TEC, I create a voltage, a current. Now you notice when I touch this, that there's a little negative over there. So I'm producing a voltage in the negative direction. If I heat the other side, I get a positive voltage. So it's truly bi-directional whether you're generating power or whether you're consuming power. Now based on that, you would think that these things should be far more popular. They have so many advantages. But there is a reason why this is not very frequently used and it's a huge reason. This type of cooling system is not very efficient. Efficiency in refrigeration systems is uh, determined or expressed in what's called COP, C-O-P, which stands for coefficient of performance. A cooling system that has a coefficient of performance of, or a COP, of one, means that for one watt applied to the system, 
you will pump one watt from the coal to the hot side. A cop of two means that for one watt of work applied to the system, you will pump two watts. A run-of-the-mill phase change refrigeration system will have a cop of around six or seven. And if you do everything right with a TEC, you might get to a cop of two. Now that low efficiency might seem to be a deal killer, but not necessarily because there are a lot of advantages to these TECs. And if it turns out that, let's say, running a refrigerator with a Peltier device will cost you 10 cents a day and running it with a TEC, excuse me, with a um, phase change refrigeration system will cost you 3 cents a day, that difference may not be significant to overwhelm those advantages. So the real question you have to ask is, well, how much is the difference? Is it 3 cents a day or $3 a day? And to determine that, you have to determine how much heat do you actually have to pump. In order to understand that, we have to decide what we're going to use to insulate the refrigerator. There are two materials, polystyrene foam and polyurethane foam, that are overwhelmingly the best choices because of availability, cost, and performance. Polyurethane has a 25% better blockage of heat flow, and so we're going to stick with that material. Now the way that this material is described in terms of its ability to resist the heat of flow is called an R value. And for you metric people out there, I'm going to have to ask you to get out your conversion tables because this is a completely imperial system of measurement, but it's pretty easy to remember. A one square foot piece, one inch thick of your insulation, will flow one BTU per hour per one degree Fahrenheit differential between the two surfaces. Now, polyurethane has an R value of six, and the thickest available panels of the polyurethane foam are two inches thick. As a consequence, a one foot square piece of polyurethane foam two inches thick will flow one twelfth of a BTU per hour, um, per, hour uh, per degree Fahrenheit temperature differential. Next question is, how many square feet do we have? In order to calculate that, because the insulation is thick, you can't really take the outside dimensions or the inside dimensions of your refrigerator. You need to add up the inside dimensions of your refrigerator, and then you add up the outside dimensions of your refrigerator, and then you take the average. And as it turns out, in this mini fridge, which is about 50% bigger than the, the small mini fridges that you commonly see, the square footage works out to 24 square feet. So with two inch insulation flowing one twelfth of a BTU, uh, excuse me, one twelfth of a BTU per hour per degree Fahrenheit and 24 square feet, we're going to be flowing two BTU per hour per degree Fahrenheit. And if we're going to be using this uh, refrigerator at let's say around 60 degrees, 67 degrees, and we want it to be operating internally at about 37 degrees, that's a 30 degree Fahrenheit temperature differential. 30 times 2 is 60 BTU per hour. 60 BTU per hour is equivalent to 20 watts per hour. How much cooling is that in terms of the way the TECs operate? If you take a look at this graph that I have here, this is for this identical unit here. And what you notice is with these colored lines, these each represent a voltage applied to the TEC. 4 volts, 9 volts, 13 volts. And if you look down at the x-axis, for let's say a typical 20 degree temperature differential between the two sides of the Peltier, if we have, let's say, 9 volts applied to the Peltier, that's the blue line, we look over to the y-axis and we see that we will pump 40 watts. So for a 9 volt potential across one TEC, we are actually going to be pumping twice as much heat as this entire refrigerator should need to maintain a useful temperature. Now in this refrigerator, as you can see on the back from the plates, we have six TECs. The reason for that is at even lower voltages, these become more efficient. And if this is a practical refrigerator, we have to be able to open the door, close the door, take out cold food, put in warm food. So we want to operate this thing with a little bit of a margin in order to provide uh, more efficiency and, and a usable refrigerator. Now one thing you might think is, 
well, wait a minute, if I go up to a higher voltage, I could get even more cooling from this unit. Look at this. If we take a look at this line here, which is the 13.8 volt line, or excuse me, the 18 volt line, twice what I just suggested in the first example, that's this pink line up here. If you take the same temperature differential and you carry it all the way up here to the 18 volt line and travel over here, you'll see that you'll pump about 90 watts, a little more than double the amount of cooling capacity. But remember, because these are resistive loads, if you double the voltage, you double the current as well. So it takes four times as much power to pump a little over twice as much heat. In addition, because this is going to be much hotter, it's going to be operating uh, with more electrical input and trying to move more cool air or more uh, thermal energy out of the refrigerator, the hot side of the TEC will become even hotter. You'll need even a slightly higher temperature differential to equal the performance of the lower energy operation. This becomes even more inefficient. And that's why you want to operate these things as gently as possible. And that's why whenever you see these things advertised as 500 watt TECs, that number is almost meaningless. Now, in order to operate these things efficiently, I've worked with these for many decades. And I can tell you that the biggest challenge in getting these things to operate is getting rid of the heat. Because when they call them thermal electric coolers, that's a misnomer. They're thermal electric heat pumps or heat differential machines. And so what happens is that if the hot side, let's say gets 20 degrees hotter because of the heat that's transferred from the cold side and the electrical energy that has to be dumped as well, and you're producing a 20 degree temperature differential, the cold side is at room temperature. You haven't refrigerated anything. So to get the cold side cold, you have to keep the hot side cool. And that's why the biggest challenge is to get rid of the heat. Now, if you go on YouTube, you'll see a lot of people have built these tiny little refrigerators to cool, say, a single can of pop. And what they'll do is they'll place a TEC onto, very often, a CPU cooler for uh, cooling a CPU in a computer. Now, this is not a bad idea. These are relatively inexpensive. They come with a nice surface for absorbing the heat from the TEC that's typically about the same size as commonly available TECs. Little difficulty is that because you've got to fit this into a computer case, this has to have very, very fine um, spacings between its um, heat spreaders in order to provide enough contact area to get the heat out and into the air. And because these spaces are so small, you have to use forced air in order to get the cooling to occur. Now, because this refrigerator is going to try to operate as efficiently as possible, and because we're going to go ahead and try to operate this thing potentially with as little electrical power as possible, we've placed a large number of plates on the back of here, on the back of the refrigerator, that have a very large square meter area. The surface area on these plates is approximately 12 times as great as the surface area on even this Mongo CPU cooler. In addition, we're going to try an experiment where we operate this refrigerator without even using fans, with no moving parts. And in order to do that, we need convective cooling to occur. We need the heating that occurs between the plates, that the heating of the air that causes the air to become less dense, lighter, flows upward and is replaced by cool air. And that very slow airflow requires a large cross-sectional area in addition to a large surface area. It may turn out that that doesn't work. We'll find out, but it's an interesting experiment. And that's one of the reasons why we spaced these out as far as we did. Now, when you're doing a cooling system with a Peltier, there are basically three legs to the stool. There is the conduction system that carries the heat into the heat spreaders. There are the heat spreaders that transfer the heat into the air. And then finally, the air moving system, which is the fan. And in general, you want to balance the heat drop that occurs through this system on each of the three legs. So if, for example, the hot side of your TEC is going to be, say, six degrees warmer than ambient, it always has to be warmer. Otherwise, heat wouldn't flow out of it. But if that is a six degree temperature over ambient, you're going to want a gain or a drop of two degrees in your conduction system, two degrees into your plates, and two degrees into the airflow that's occurring through the, through the, the plates. The 
system can be improved by improving any one of those. But if you improve one of them and don't improve the other two, you reach a region of diminishing returns because you're going to be held back by the other two systems. I'm going to demonstrate how that works in just a second. But if we look now, we can see that the temperature here is stabilized at around 61 degrees. When I pull this test tube out, you're going to see what happens to the temperature. Hopefully my arm is going to be out of the way. 61 degrees, pull it out, <clears throat> and you can see what happens to the temperature. So it's not a huge change, but it definitely does occur. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up another example here to prove why it's important to balance all these different functions. Now I'm going to show you why it's important to balance the three legs of the heat extraction system. I have a two and a half kilogram block of aluminum here that is bonded to a heat sink with a lot of fins and with some heat pipes to conduct the heat from the fins into the aluminum or out. And what I'm going to do into this hot pot of water is I'm going to dip this end only into the pot and we're going to see how long it takes for the temperature to begin to distribute down to the thermistor that I've bonded all the way at the other end of this block. If you look at the temperature meter right here, it's reading about 80.9, 80.8 degrees. When I dip this in here, watch the clock, it's at about 21 minutes after 8, and we're going to see how long it takes for this temperature to rise. Now we're at 81.0 degrees, and we're going to give this a minute or two, and we're going to see how quickly this goes. Now what we're going to want to do is we're going to see how long it takes for the temperature here to rise from say around 120 degrees up to say about 130 degrees where we're going to stop the heating process. So right now it's about 826 and we're at 120. Now the temperature will continue to go up as the heat's conducted all the way through the block. And once we get to 130, I'm going to take this out, and then we're going to test the cooling operation. So it looks like it's going to take about four minutes for the heat to be conducted into this block. Now when I remove this block from the water bath, To dry it off, blow out some of this water, and then I'm going to place this into this insulating box so that the only way that the heat is going to be able to escape ah, from this is going to be for it to conduct through the block but out here through convection. So the limiting factor here is going to be the convective cooling due to the rising of the heat. Now if we look at the clock, we have approximately 830 and it's at 132.4 degrees. Let's see how long this takes to drop down to 120 degrees. Okay, so now we've gotten to 120 degrees and it took us approximately 22 minutes to do that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to extract this from the insulating block and I'm once again going to put this back into the hot water and we're going to bring it back as close as we can to that temperature of 132 and a half degrees. Once we get there, we're going to go ahead and do this test again, but this time with some forced air cooling. Now if we look at the temperature, we're at 132.4, we're at about one minute before nine o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and place this back into the insulating support, insulating box. 
But now this time I'm going to add the stock cooling fan that this heatsink had come with. It's rated at 30 cubic feet per minute. And we're going to see how long it takes to bring the temperature down to 120 degrees. So there we go, 120, and it took about four minutes for us to get the temperature down to 120. Now we're going to do this one more time. Back into the pot. All right, now I've got a little over temp, so it's going to take a minute or two for this to cool down. I'm just removing any water here so that we're not adding any kind of... Uh, evaporative process to this experiment. Now we're going to let this cool down a little bit till we get to the 132.4. Okay, so we're basically at about the same temperature, 132.1. I'm going to push, put it back in the insulator and now I'm going to put on a fan that is rated at 180 cubic feet per minute. So it's six times as powerful as the stock fan. And we're going to see how long this takes to cool down. So 920. So it took about three minutes for this fan with six times the capacity to cool off this block about 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And it took about four minutes for the stock fan to cool down the block. So in this case, clearly it's not the fan or the airflow that's the limiting factor. In this case, it's clearly the surface area of the cooling fins that represent the limiting factor. The block itself would transmit that amount of heat from the thermistor just through uh, conduction when we put the hot end in the, into the water in also about four minutes. So. In the case of a convective cooling system, we're going to be limited with air. In the case of a small surface area, you're going to be limited by the fins. And in the case of a thin conductor, thinner than this, you're going to need to have a much, um, you're going to require a much lower capacity fan or smaller area than even this to balance that kind of conduction pathway. So in designing our refrigerator, uh, we did a few things and I'm going to show you the examples of uh, some of the design principles, some of the design uh, features of the particular fridge. Let me give you a little tour. Now to fabricate this refrigerator, what we did is we took two sheets of aluminum and bent them into U shapes and then rotated one of the U's and nested it inside of the other one to form four thermally conductive walls with a double thickness back. If you look inside, you'll see six blocks that act as pressure plates that will be used to squeeze the conduction pathway against the TECs. You see two fans here that are going to be used to provide some circulation if it turns out the totally convective operation doesn't work. If you come around to the side, you'll see that there are some aluminum blocks here and then the entire sort of thermal conductive pathway passes all the way through the, the fins until you get to another compression block on the back surface. These four threaded rods are made out of stainless steel so they have low thermal conductivity and these nuts will allow us to squeeze or compress the whole um, apparatus against the TECs which are located right here. You'll notice that this particular block right here is a little thicker. And the reason we did that is because we needed to provide an insulator between the cold and the warm heat sink. And so these holes allow the thermal conductivity of the cool to pass with, between, um, through the insulator uh, before it gets to the heat sink. You'll also notice we decided to put the TEC on this side of the block as opposed to against the back of the refrigerator itself because the TEC has to conduct heat out along with the thermal energy or the electricity that's used to power it. So there's always more heat to remove than cold to conduct. And so if you're ever going to do thermal conduct 
connection with uh, these TECs, you always want to conduct the cold rather than the heat and keep the heat sink as close as possible to the hot side. Each of these little spacer blocks has been sanded smooth so that it's quite flat. And in addition to using some thermal grease, we're going to be compressing this block very hard because the TEC will tolerate up to 200 PSI. As long as the surfaces are very flat and the pressure is even, the harder you squeeze it, the more effective the condu conduction path is, even if we do use some thermal interface material like a grease. You'll also notice on the back, if you come fully around over here, you'll see the four low speed fans that we've installed in case convective cooling isn't sufficient. And then we have the 24 volt power supply here that will allow us to mix and match different voltages to determine what's going to end up being optimal. Finally, we're going to put a temperature controller on this. But at this point, the last thing I want to mention on the front is you might have noticed that I've painted the inside of the refrigerator. This is not done just for fancy. Warm bodies like myself, the room, even food within a refrigerator radiate a significant amount of thermal energy in the thermal infrared. And metal, especially aluminum, is highly reflective to the thermal infrared. So when the food is radiating its heat to the walls, you don't want it to bounce off the walls and be reabsorbed by the food. So placing just a couple of microns of an organic material like a paint will allow the surface to absorb the infrared. It will transfer its heat to the conductive aluminum and then be transported out. A couple of microns paint of paint is not going to have any insulating properties. And it doesn't matter what color you use. In the thermal infrared, all colors are black. I just chose white because it looks nice and clean. Finally, we have a little shelf here. And you might have also noticed that these panels are not perfectly 90 degree angles. The simple reason for that is when we put the insulating material around here, the panels will stay uh, pressed up against them without needing any adhesives to keep them uh, against the surfaces. This is just basically a neatness factor. Other than that, we pretty much have run through everything. And now what I'm going to do is go ahead and show you the assembly of the uh, refrigerator.
Okay, so there you have it. In about uh, 24 hours, what you're going to want to do is give a second tightening to the uh, screws that compress the thermal stacks because as the grease kind of oozes out between them, you can compress them and achieve a little bit higher pressure, better contact. But other than that, we're done with the build. I'm going to wire this up, put on the controller, and in a few days we will post the video where we test this with uh, actual food loads and timing, and we'll see if we can run this without fans, and if not, just how well it performs. So, that's about it for tonight. Got a successful fit. Everything looks good. And I want to thank you. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, please subscribe. And I wish you a very good evening. Take care. Good night.